Part One, Chapter One of Doctor Izard by Anna Catherine Green. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lee Smalley. Part One: A Midnight Visitant. Chapter One, Number Thirteen, Ward Thirteen. It was after midnight quiet had settled over the hospital and in ward thirteen there was no sound and scarcely a movement the nurse a strong and beautiful figure had fallen into a reverie and the two patients which were all the ward contained lay in a sleep so deep that it seemed to foreshadow the death which was hovering over them both they were both men the one on the right of the nurse was middle-aged the one on the left somewhat older both were gaunt both were hollow-eyed, both had been given up by the doctors and attendants. Yet there was one point of difference between them. He on the left, the older of the two, had an incurable complaint for which no remedy was possible, while he on the right, though seemingly as ill as his fellow, was less seriously affected, and stood some chance of being saved, if only he would arouse from his apathy and exert his will toward living but nothing had as yet been found to interest him, and he seemed likely to die from sheer inanition. It is through this man's eyes that we must observe the scene which presently took place in this quiet room. He had been lying, as I have said, in a dreamless sleep, when something, he never knew what, made him conscious of himself and partially awake to his surroundings. He found himself listening, but there was no sound, and his eyes, which he had not unclosed for hours, slowly opened, and through the shadows which encompassed him broke a dim vision of the silent ward and the sitting figure of the weary nurse. It was an accustomed sight, and his eyes were softly reclosing, when a sudden movement on the part of the nurse roused him again to something like interest, and though his apathy was yet too great for him to make a movement or utter a sound, he perceived, though with dim eyes at first, that the door at the other end of the ward had slowly opened, and that two men were advancing down the room to the place where the nurse stood waiting, in evident surprise to greet them. One was the hospital doctor, and on him the sick man cast but a single glance. But the person with him was a stranger, and upon him the attention of the silent watcher became presently concentrated, for his appearance was singular and his errand one of evident mystery. There was but one light in the room, and this was burning low, so that the impression received was general rather than particular. He saw before him a medium-sized man who sought to hide his face from observation, though his face was already sufficiently shielded by the semi-darkness and by the brim of a large hat which for some reason he had omitted to remove. Around his shoulders there hung a cloak of an old-fashioned type, and as he approached the spot where the nurse stood, his form, which had shown some dignity while he was advancing, contracted itself in such a fashion that he looked smaller than he really was. The physician who accompanied him was the first to speak. "'Is number twelve asleep?' he asked. The nurse bowed slightly, half turning her head as she did so. The watching man was number thirteen, not number twelve, but his eyes shut at the question, perhaps because he was still overcome by his apathy, perhaps because his curiosity had been aroused and he feared to stop events by betraying his interest in them. "'I am afraid we shall have to wake him,' pursued the attendant physician. "'This gentleman here, who declines to give his name, but who has brought letters which sufficiently recommend him to our regard, professes to have business with this patient which will not keep till morning.' Has the patient shown any further signs of sinking? She answered in a cheerful tone that he had slept since ten without waking, and the two men began to approach. As they did so, both turned toward the bed of the second sick man, and one of them, the stranger, remarked with something like doubt in his tones, Is this man as low as he looks? Is he dying too? The answer was a qualified one, and the stranger appeared to turn his back but presently the strained ears of the seemingly unconscious man heard a breath panting near his own, and was conscious of some person bending over his cot. 
Next minute the question was whispered in his hearing. "'Are you sure this man is asleep?' The doctor, who was standing close by, murmured an affirmative, and the nurse to whom the questioner had apparently turned, observed without any hesitation, in her slightly mystified tone, "'I have not seen him move since eight o'clock. Besides, if he were awake, he would show no consciousness. He is dying from sheer hopelessness, and a cannon fired at his side would not rouse him.' The humph, which this assurance called forth from the stranger, had a peculiar sound in it, but the attention which had been directed to number thirteen now passed to his neighbour, and the former, feeling himself for the instant unobserved, partially opened his eyes to see how that neighbour was affected by it. A few whispered words had accomplished what a cannon had been thought unable to do, and he was beginning to realise an interest in life, or, at least, in what was going on in reference to his fellow-patient. The words were these. "'This is a hopeless case, is it?' "'Yes, sir. How long a time do you give him?' The tone was professional, though not entirely unsympathetic. "'Dr. Sweet says a week. I say three days.' The stranger bent over the patient, and it was at this point that the watcher's eyes opened. Three days is nearer the mark,' the visitor at last declared, at which the attending physician bowed. "'I should be glad to have a few moments' conversation with your patient,' the stranger now pursued. "'If he is unhappy, I think I can bring him comfort. He has relatives, you say?' "'Yes, a daughter, over whose helpless position he constantly grieves.' is he poor then very good i have pleasant news for him will you allow me to rouse him certainly if you have a communication justifying the slight shock the stranger whose head had sunk upon his breast cast a keen look around i beg your pardon said he but i must speak to the man alone he himself would choose it but neither you nor the nurse need leave the room the doctor bowed and withdrew with marked respect. The nurse lingered a moment, during which both of the sick men lay equally quiet and death-like. Then she also stepped aside. The stranger was left standing between the two beds. Soon the sensitive ears of the watchful one heard these words. "'Your little daughter sends her love.' Opening his eyes a trifle, he saw the stranger bending over the other's pillow. A sigh which was not new to his ears rose from his dying companion, at sound of which the stranger added softly, "'You fear to leave the child, but God is merciful. He makes it possible for you to provide for her. Do you want to hear how?' A low cry, then a sudden feeble move, and number twelve was speaking in hurried, startled words. "'Who are you, sir? What do you want with me? And what are you saying about my child?' I don't know you. No, and yet I am likely to be your greatest benefactor. But first take these few drops. They will help you to understand me. You are afraid? You need not be. I am. He whispered a name into the sick man's ear, which his companion could not catch. That is our secret, he added, and one which I charge you to preserve. Number thirteen, unable to restrain his curiosity at this, stole another glance at the adjoining cot from under his scarcely lifted lids. His moribund neighbour had risen partially on his pillow, and was gazing with burning intensity at the man who was leaning toward him. "'Oh, sir,' came from the pale and working lips, as he tried to raise a feeble hand, "'you mean to help my little one? You? But why should you do it?' What claim has my misfortune, or her innocence on you, that you should concern yourself with our desperate condition?" "'No claim,' came in the stranger's calm but impressive tones. "'It is not charity I seek to bestow on you, but payment for a service you can render me, a perfectly legitimate, though somewhat unusual one,' he hastened to add, as the man's face showed doubt. "'What, what is it?' faltered from the sick man's lips in mingled doubt and hope. What can a poor and wretched being, doomed to speedy death, do for a man like you? I fear you are mocking me, sir. You can be the medium, the words came slowly, and with some hesitation, for the payment of a debt I dare not liquidate in my own person. 
I owe someone, a large amount, of money. If I give it to you, he leaned closer and spoke lower, but the ears that were listening were very sharp, and not a syllable was lost. Will you give it to the person whom I will name? But how? When? I am dying, they say, and— Do not worry about the whens and hows. I will make all that easy. The question is, will you, for the sum of five thousand dollars, which I here show you in ten five hundred dollar bills, consent to sign a will, bequeathing this other little package of money to a certain young woman whom I will name? Five thousand dollars? Oh, sir, do not mislead a dying man. Five thousand dollars? Why, it would be a fortune to Lucy. A fortune that she shall have, the other assured him. Just for signing my name? Just for signing your name to a will which will bequeath the rest of your belongings, namely this little package, to an equally young and equally unfortunate girl. It seems right. I do not see anything wrong with it, murmured the dying father, in a voice that had strangely strengthened. Will you assure me that it is all right, and that no one will suffer by my action? Did I not tell you who I was? asked the stranger, and cannot you trust one of my reputation? You will be doing a good act, a retributive act, one that will have the blessing of providence upon it. But why this secrecy? Why do you come to me instead of paying the debt yourself? Is she... She is who she is, was the somewhat stern interruption. You do not know her. No one here knows her. Will you do what I ask, or must I turn to your companion, who seems as ill as yourself? I, I want to do it, sir. Five thousand dollars. Let me feel of the bills that represent so much. There was a movement, and the sick and feeble voice rose again in a tone of ecstatic delight. And I need not worry any more about her feet without shoes, and her pretty head without shelter. She will be a lady and go to school, and by and by can learn a trade and live respectably. Oh, thank God, sir, I know who I would like to have made her guardian. Then you consent? cried the stranger, with a thrill of some strong feeling in his voice. I do, sir, and thank you. Only you must be quick, for there is no knowing how soon the end may come. The stranger, who seemed to be equally apprehensive of the results of this strong excitement, raised himself upright and motioned to the doctor and the nurse. "'You will say nothing of our compact,' he enjoined in a final whisper, as the two summoned ones approached. "'Nor will you express surprise at the wording of the will, or, indeed, at anything I may say.' "'No,' came in an almost undistinguishable murmur and then there was silence, till the doctor and the nurse were within hearing, when the stranger said, "'Our friend here has a small matter of business on his mind. It has been my pleasure, as I perhaps intimated to you, to bring him a considerable sum of money which he had despaired of ever having paid him, and as for reasons he is not willing to communicate, he desires to bequeath a portion of it to a person not related to him. He naturally finds it necessary to leave a will.' Foreseeing this, I had the draft of one drawn up, which, if agreeable to you, I will read to him in your presence. The amazement in the nurse's eye gave way to a look of deference, and she bowed slightly. The doctor nodded his head, and both took their stand at the foot of the small cot. The man in the adjoining bed neither murmured nor moved. Had they looked at him, they would have doubtless thought his sleep was doing him but little good for his pallor had increased, and an icy sweat glistened on his forehead. "'Mr. Hazlitt's property,' continued the stranger, in a low and mechanical tone, "'consists entirely of money. Is that not so?' he asked, smiling upon the dazed, but yet strangely happy face of the patient lying before him. "'Namely, this roll of bills, amounting, as you see, to five thousand dollars, and this small package of banknotes, of which the amount is not stated, but of whose value he is probably aware. Are you willing, he turned to the doctor, to take charge of these valuables, and see that they are forthcoming at the proper time? The doctor bowed, 
glanced at his patient, and meeting his eager eye, took the roll of bills and the package, and putting them into his breast pocket, remarked, I will have them placed in the safe deposit vaults to-morrow. Very well, cried the stranger. That will be all right, will it not? he asked, consulting in his turn the man before him. Mr. Hazlitt, as they called him, gave him a short look, smiled again, and said, You know best, anything, so that my Lucy gets her five thousand. The stranger, straightening himself, asked if he could not have more light, at which the nurse brought a candle. Immediately the stranger took a paper from under his cloak and opened it. The nurse held the candle, and the stranger began to read. The last will and testament of Abram Hazlitt of Chicago, Cook County, Illinois. First, I direct all my just debts and funeral expenses to be paid. Second, I give, devise, and bequeath to... Is your daughter's name Lucy, and is the sum you wish given her five thousand dollars exact? asked the stranger, sitting down at the small table nearby, and taking out a pen from his pocket. Yes, was the feeble response. Five thousand dollars to Lucy Ellen, my only and much beloved child. The stranger rapidly wrote in the words, adding, She lives in Chicago, I suppose? It was the nurse who answered. She is in this hospital too, sir, but not for any mortal complaint. Time and care will restore her. The stranger went on reading. I give, devise, and bequeath to my only and much-loved child, Lucy Ellen of Chicago, Cook County, Illinois, the sum of five thousand dollars. Second, I give, devise, and bequeath to... Did you say the name was Mary Earle, and that she lived in Hamilton? Blank County, Massachusetts, he interjected, looking inquiringly at the man whose sagacity he thus trusted. Yes, yes, was the hurried, almost faint answer. You know, you know, go on quickly, for I am feeling very weak. They gave him stimulants, while the stranger rapidly wrote in certain words, which he as rapidly read in what one listener thought to be a much relieved tone. I give, devise, and bequeath to Mary Earl of Hamilton, Blank County, Massachusetts, all my remaining property, as found in the package of banknotes, deposited in the safe deposit vaults of this city, in payment of an old debt to her father, and as an expression of my regret that my hitherto destitute circumstances have prevented me from sooner recognizing her claims upon me. Third, I appoint Dr. Cusack of the Chicago General Hospital sole executor of this my last will and testament. Witness my hand this thirteenth day of April in the year 1892. Signed, published, and declared by the testator to be his last will and testament, in our presence, and who, at his request, and in his presence, and in the presence of each other, have subscribed our names hereto as witnesses on this thirteenth day of April, 1892. "'Does this paper express your wishes and all your wishes?' asked the stranger, pausing. "'Is there any change you would like made, or is the will as it stands right?' "'Right, right,' came in more feeble tones from the fast-sinking sufferer. "'Then, if you will call in another witness, I will submit the paper to him to sign,' said the stranger, turning toward the doctor. "'As executor, you cannot act as witness.' The doctor turned to the nurse, and a momentary consultation passed between them. Then she quietly withdrew, and in a few minutes returned with a man who, from his appearance, evidently occupied some such position as watchman. The sick man was raised higher in his bed, and a pen put in his hand. "'Mr. Hazlitt is about to sign his will,' explained the stranger, and, turning to the sick man, he put the formal question. Is this paper which I here place before you, your last will and testament, and do you accept these two persons now before you, as witnesses to your signing of the same?" A feeble assent followed both these questions, whereupon the stranger put his finger on the place where the dying man was expected to write his name. As he did so, a strange sensation seemed to affect every one present for the men with an involuntary movement all raised their eyes to the ceiling, 
upon which the stooping form of the stranger made such a weird shadow while the nurse gave evident signs of momentary perturbation which she as a woman of many experiences would doubtless have found it hard to explain even to herself a short silence followed which was presently broken by the scratching of a pen the patient was writing his name but how slowly he seemed to be minutes in doing it suddenly he fell back a smile of perfect peace lighting up his shrunken features lucy's future is assured he murmured and lost or seemed to lose all connection with the scene in which he had just played such an important part a deep sigh answered him whose it had the sound of relief in it a great soul-satisfying relief had the stranger uttered it it would seem so but his manner was too professional to be the cloak of so much emotion or so it seemed to all eyes but one the witnesses signatures were soon in place and the stranger rose to go as he did so his eyes flashed suddenly over his shoulder and rested for an instant on the man who occupied the neighbouring cot the movement was so quick that number thirteen had scarcely time to close his eyes undetected indeed some glint of the half-hidden eyeball must have met the stranger's eye for he turned quickly and bent over the seemingly unconscious man with a gaze of such intentness that it took all the strength of what had once been called a most obstinate will for the man thus surveyed not to respond to it suddenly the stranger thrust his hand out and laid it on the unknown sufferer's heart and a slight smile crossed his features is there anything i can do for you were the words he dropped cold and stinging into the apparently deaf ear but the man's will was indomitable and an icy silence was the sole answer which the intruder received i have still a thousand to give away was whispered so close into his face that he felt the hot breath that conveyed it but even these words fell or seemed to fall upon ears of stony deafness and the stranger rising moved quietly away saying as he did so this case here is on the mend his heart has a very normal beat some few more words were said and he and his companion were left alone again with the nurse at three o'clock number twelve called feebly for some water as the nurse returned from giving it to him she felt her dress pulled slightly by a feeble hand turning to number thirteen she was astonished to see that his eyes were burning with quite an eager light i could drink some broth said he why you are better she cried but he shook his head no said he but the voice trailed off into a feeble murmur but the eye continued bright he was afraid to speak for fear his lips would frame aloud the words that he had been repeating to himself for the last two hours mary earl mary earl of hamilton blank county massachusetts he had found the interest which had been lacking to his recovery end of part one chapter one part two chapter two of dr izard by anna katherine green this librivox recording is in the public domain Part Two: The Man with the Dog, Chapter Two: Hadley's Cave. On the first day of June, eighteen ninety-two, there could be seen on the highway near the small village of Hamilton a dusty wanderer with a long beard and rough, unkempt hair. From the silver streaks in the latter, and from his general appearance and feeble walk, he had already passed the virile point of life and had entered upon or was about to enter upon the stage of decrepitude and yet the eyes which burned beneath the grey and shaggy brows were strangely bright and had an alertness of expression which contradicted the weary bend of the head and the slow dragging of the rough-shod feet his dress was that of a farm labourer and from the smallness of the bundle which he carried on a stick over his shoulder he had evidently been out of work for some time, and was as poor as he was old and helpless. At the junction of the two roads leading to Leddington and Wells, he stopped and drew a long breath. 
Then he sat down on a huge stone in the cross of the roads and, drooping his head, gazed long and earnestly at the length of dusty road which separated him from the cluster of steeples and house roofs before him. Was he dreaming or planning, or was he merely weary? A sound at his side startled him. Turning his head, he saw a dog. It was a very lean one, and its attitude as it stood gazing into his face with wistful eyes was one of entreaty. Come, it seemed to say, and ran off a few steps. The tramp, for we can call him nothing else, though there was a dash of something like refinement in his look and manner, stared for a moment after the animal, then he slowly rose. But he did not follow the dog. The disappointment of the latter was evident. Coming back to the man, he sniffed and pulled at his clothes, and cast such beseeching looks upward out of his all but human eyes, but the man, though naturally surly, was touched at last, and turned in the direction indicated by the dog. "'After all, why not?' he murmured, and strolled on after his now delighted guide up one of the roads to a meadow terminating in an abrupt and rocky steep. "'Why am I such a fool?' he asked himself when halfway across the stubbly field. But at the short bark of the dog, and the irresistible wagging of the animal's tail, he stumbled on, influenced no doubt by some superstitious feeling which bade him regard the summons of this unusually sagacious beast as an omen he dared not disregard. At the foot of the rocks he, however, paused. Why should he climb them at the bidding of a dog? But his guide was imperative, and pulled at his trousers so energetically that he finally mounted a short distance, when, to his surprise, he came upon a cave, into the entrance of which the dog plunged with a short sharp cry of pleasure and satisfaction. Hesitating to follow, the man stood for a moment gazing back upon the town and the stretch of lovely landscape before him. It was an outlook of great charm, but I doubt if he noticed its beauties. Some thought of an unpleasant and perplexing nature furrowed his brow, and it was with a start that he turned, when the dog, reissuing from the cave, renewed his blandishments, and by dint of bark and whine attempted to draw him into the opening before which he stood. What was in hiding there? Curiosity bade him look, but a certain not unreasonable apprehension deterred him. He finally, however, overcame his fear, if fear it was, and followed the dog, that no sooner saw him start toward the entrance than he gave a leap of delight and bounded into the cave before him. In another moment the man had entered also, and was looking around for the helpless or wounded human being whom he evidently expected to find. But no such sight met his eyes. On the contrary, he saw nothing but an empty cave with here and there a sign of the place having been used as a domicile at a recent date. In one corner was a litter of boughs from which the covering had manifestly been roughly torn, and in the ledges overhead were to be seen spikes of wood, upon which utensils had doubtless been hung, for amid the debris of broken rock beneath lay an old tin pan with the handle broken off. As there was nothing in this to interest the man, he turned and kicked at the inoffensive beast who had lured him out of his path on such a fruitless errand. But the latter, instead of resenting this harshness, only renewed his previous antics, and finally, succeeded by them in reattracting the man's attention, led the way to a remote corner of the cave, where the shadows were thickest. Here he stood with his paws raised against the rocky sides, looking up over his head, and then back at the man in a way which left no doubt as to his meaning. He wanted the man to climb, and when the man approaching saw the few rocky steps that had been hewn out of the wall, his curiosity was renewed, and he lent himself to the effort, old as he was, and tired with many a long hour of tramping in the summer sun. Above him he perceived a dark hole, and into this he presently thrust his head, but the darkness which he encountered was so impenetrable that he would have instantly retreated had he not remembered the box of matches which kept guard with an old pipe in a certain pocket of his red flannel shirt. Taking out this box, he struck a match and, as soon as the first dazzling flash was over, perceived that he was in a small but well-furnished room, stocked with provisions and containing many articles of domestic use. 
This so surprised him that he withdrew in some haste, though he would dearly have liked to have made some investigation into the old chest of drawers he saw there, and had one peep at least into the odd long box which took up so much of the darkened space into which he had intruded. The dog was waiting for him below, and at his reappearance leaped and bounded with delight, and then lay down on the floor of the cave with such an inviting wriggle of the tail that the man understood him at last. It was a lodging that the dog offered him, a lodging which had been occupied by a former master, and which the faithful creature still watched over and hungered in, as his appearance amply showed. The man to whom a human being might have appealed in vain was grimly touched by this benevolent action on the part of a dog, and stooping quickly he gave him a short caress, after which he rose and stood hesitating for a moment, casting short glances behind him. But the temptation, if it was such, to remain did not hold him long, for presently he motioned to the dog to follow him, and issuing from the cave began his weary tramp toward the town. The dog, with fallen tail and drooping head, trotted slowly after him, and this was the first adventure which met this man in the little town of Hamilton. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 of Dr. Izard by Anna Catherine Green This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Young Heiress that night five men sat on the porch of the one tavern in Hamilton. Of these one was the landlord, a spare, caustic New Englander, who understood his business and left it to his wife to do the agreeable. Of the remaining four, two were the inevitable loungers to be found around all such places at nightfall, and the other two wayfarers who had taken up lodgings for the night. The dog lying contentedly at the feet of one of these latter tells us who he was. The talk was on local subjects, and included more or less gossip. Who had started it? No one knew, but the least interested person in the group was apparently the man with the dog. He sat and smoked, because it was the hour for sitting and smoking, but he neither talked nor listened, that is, to all appearance, and when he laughed, as he occasionally did, it was more at some unexpected antic on the part of the dog than at anything which was said in his hearing but he was old and nobody wondered. The last subject under discussion was the engagement of a certain young lady to a New York medical student. Which means, I take it, that Dr. Izard will not continue to have full swing here, observed one of the stragglers. Folks say as how her people won't hear of her leaving home, so he'll have to come to Hamilton. I shan't lend him my old body to experiment on if he does, spoke up the surly landlord. Dr. Izard is good enough for me. And for me. But the women folks want a change, they say. The doctor is so everlasting queer, and then he's away so much. That's because he is so skillful that even the big bugs in Boston and New York, too, I hear, want his opinion on their cases. He's not to blame for that. Great honor, I say, not only to him, but to all the town. Great honor, no doubt, but mighty inconvenient. Why, when my wife's sister was took the other night, I run all the way from my house to the doctor's, only to find the door closed, and that everlasting placard up at the side, gone out of town. I say it's a shame, I do, and no other doctor to be found within five miles. You ought to live in Boston. There they have doctors enough. Yet they send for hours. Do you know, another voice spoke up, that I had rather go sick till morning, or have one of my folks sick, than take that road up by the churchyard after ten o'clock at night. I think it's the gloomiest, most God-forsaken spot I ever struck in all my life. To think of a doctor living next door to a graveyard, it's a trifle too suggestive, I say. I wouldn't care about that if he wasn't so like a graveyard himself. I declare his look is like a hollow vault. If he wasn't so smart, I'd have sent for the Wells doctor long ago. I hate long white faces myself, no matter how handsome they are, and when he touches me with that slender cold hand of his, the shivers go all over me so that he thinks I am struck with a chill. And so I am, but not with a natural one, I vow. 
If we lived in the olden times, and such a man dared come around the deathbeds of honest people such as live in this town, he'd have been burnt as a wizard. Come, I won't hear such talk about a neighbor, let alone a man who has more than once saved the lives of all of us. He's queer, but who isn't queer? He lives alone, and cooks and sleeps and doctors all in one room, like the miser he undoubtedly is, and won't have anything to do with chick or child or man or woman who is not sick, unless you accept the village's protégé, Polly Earl, whom everybody notices and does for. But all this does not make him wicked or dangerous, or uncanny even, that is, to those who used to know him when he was young. And did you? Well, I guess I did, and a handsomer man never walked Boston streets, let alone the lanes of this poor village. They used to say in those days that he thought of marrying, but he changed his mind for some reason, and afterward grew into the kind of man you see. Good cause, I've no doubt for it. Men like him don't shut themselves up in a cage for nothing. But don't let us talk any more about the doctor, cried the lodger, who did not have a dog. You spoke of a little girl whom everybody does for. Why is that? The topic ought to be interesting. The landlord, who had talked more than his wont, frowned and filled his pipe, which had gone out. Ask them, fellers, he growled, or get my wife into a corner and ask her. She likes to spin long stories. I don't. Oh, I don't care about asking anybody, mumbled the stranger, who was a sallow-faced drummer with a weak eye and a sensual mouth. I only thought— She isn't for any such as you, if that's what you mean, volunteered the straggler, taking up the burden of the talk. She's only been looked after by the village because her case was a hard one. She was an only child, and when she was but four her mother died, after a long and curious illness, which no one understood, and three days after, her father. The dog yelped. As no one was near him but his master, he must have been hurt by that master, but how it was impossible to understand, for neither had appeared to move. "'Well, well!' cried the sallow young man. "'Her father—' "'Disappeared. He was last seen at his wife's funeral. The next day he was not to be found anywhere. That was fourteen years ago, and we know no more now than then what became of him. And the child? Was left without a soul to look after it, but the whole village has taken her in charge, and she has never suffered. She has even been educated, some say by Dr. Izard, but for this I won't vouch for he is a perfect miser in his way of living, and I don't think he would trouble himself to help anybody, even a poor motherless child. Well, if he has spent a penny for her in the past, I don't think he will be called upon to spend any in the future. I heard yesterday that she has come into a pretty property, and that, too, in a very suspicious way. What's that? You have? Why didn't you tell us so before? When a man has news, I say he ought to impart it, and that without any ifs and ands. Well, I thought it would keep, drawled the speaker, drawing back with an air of importance, as all the habitués of the place pressed upon him, and even Mrs. Husted, the landlady, stepped out of her sitting-room to listen. Well, it won't, snarled the landlord. News, like baked potatoes, must be eaten hot. Where did you hear this about Polly Earle, and what do you mean by suspicious? I mean that this money, and they do say it's a pretty sum, came to her by will, and that the man who left it was a perfect stranger to her, someone she never heard of before. Of that I'll be bound. He said in his will that he left all this money in payment of an old debt to her father. But that's all bosh. Ephraim Earl got all the money that was owing to him two weeks before he vanished out of this town, and I say— No matter what you say, broke in the crabbed landlord. She's had money left her, and now she'll get a good husband and make a show in the village. I'm glad on it, for one. She's sung and danced and made merry on nothing long enough. Let her try a little responsibility now, and return some of the favors she has received. Did you hear how much money it was? timidly asked an old man, who had just joined the group. It was just the same amount as was paid Ephraim Earl for his invention a few days before we saw the last of him. 
Lord a mercy. And which? Now this is too interesting for anything, exclaimed a female voice from a window overhead. Twenty thousand dollars! Really? What a romance! I must run and see Polly this minute. Stop her, came in guttural command from the landlord to his wife. And why should I stop her? asked that good woman, with a jolly roll of her head. Instead of stopping her, I think I will go with her. But do let us hear more about it first. What was the name of the man who left her this splendid fortune? Abram Hazlitt, somebody who lived out west. From the looks that flew from one to the other, and from the doubtful shakes of the head visible on every side, this was, as the speaker had declared, an utterly unknown name. The interest became intense. I always thought there was something wrong about Ephraim's disappearance. No man as good as he would have left a child like that of his own free will. What? Do you think this man Hazlitt had anything to do? Hush, hush. The munition came from more than one pair of lips, and even the man with the dog looked up. A young lady was coming down the street. There she is now. She's coming here. No, more likely she's on her way to tell the doctor of her good luck. Look, she has the same old smile. And the same dress. Well, she's pretty, anyhow. And such a sunbeam. Yelp, went the dog again. His master had trod on his tail for the second time. Meanwhile the cause of all this excitement had reached the walk in front of the house. Though she was tripping along in a merry fashion which was all her own, she stopped as she met Mrs. Husted's eye, and calling her down, whispered something in her ear. Then with a backward nod the young girl passed on, and everyone drew a long breath. There was something so satisfactory to them all in her ingenious manner and simple expression of youthful delight. She was a slight girl, and to those who had seen her every day for the last dozen years she was simply prettier than usual, but to the two or three strangers observing her she was a vision of madcap beauty that for the moment made every other woman previously seen forgotten. Her face, which was heart-shaped and fresh as a newly opened rose, was flushed with laughter, and the dimples which came and went with every breath so distracted the eye that it was not till she had turned her lovely countenance aside that one remembered the violet hues in her heavily lashed eyes, and the hints of feeling which emanated from them. That, with all the dignities of her newborn airship upon her, she swung a white sunbonnet on her delicate forefinger which was characteristic of the girl. The hair thus revealed to sight was of a glistening chestnut, whose somewhat rumpled curls were deliciously in keeping with the saucy poise of the unquiet head. Altogether, a decided gleam of sunshine made all the more conspicuously bright from the hints just given of the tragic history of her parents and the shadows surrounding the very gift which had called up all this pleasure into her face. "'What did she say?' whispered more than one voice as the landlady came slowly back. "'She invited me to visit her and hinted that she had something to tell me,' was the somewhat important reply." "'And when are you going?' asked one more eager than the rest. "'I may go back with her when she returns from Dr. Izard's,' was the cool and consequential response. Evidently the landlady had been raised in her own estimation by the notice given her by this former little waif. "'I wonder,' someone now ventured, "'if she is going to buy the big house over the doctor's office. I noticed that the windows were open today. "'Pshaw!' and her father's house lying idle. Her father's house? Good gracious, would you have the child go there? You make the chills run over me. Nobody would go into that house with her. It hasn't been opened in fourteen years. The more shame, growled the landlord. She'll never have anything to do with that. I've seen her run by it myself, as if the very shadow it cast was terrifying to her. Yet folks thought it was a cosy home when Ephraim took his young wife there. I remember myself, the brass andirons in the parlor, and the long row of books in the big hall upstairs. To think that those books have never been opened these fourteen years, not the floors trod on, nor the curtains drawn back. 
I declare it's the most creepy thing of the whole affair. And how do you know that the floor hasn't been walked on, nor the curtains drawn, since we took the child out from her desolate corner in the old bedroom upstairs? suggested another voice in an odd, mysterious tone. Because the doors were locked and the keys put where no one in the town could get at them. We thought it best. There was death on the walls everywhere, and the child had no money to be brought up in any such a grand way as that. Folks, as I mean, don't need keys, murmured the other under his breath, but the suggestion, if it were such, was immediately laughed down. You're a fool, Jacob. We're in the nineteenth century now, the era of electric lights and trolley cars. I know, I know, but I've seen more than once on a dark night the shifting of a light behind those drawn curtains, and once... But the laughter was against him, and he desisted, and another man spoke up, the lodger with the sallow face. Why didn't they sell the old place if the child was left as poor as you say? Why, man, its owner might be living. Ephraim Earl only disappeared, you know, and might have returned any day. Leastwise, that is what we thought then. Now we no longer expect it. I wonder who'll act as her guardian. She's of age. She don't need no guardian. Well, it's a precious mystery, the whole thing. I wonder if the police won't see something in it. Bah, police! They had the chance at the thing fourteen years ago. And what did they do with it? Nothing. But now there's a clue. This man Hazlitt knew what became of Ephraim Earl, or why did he leave that very same amount to his daughter? Lord knows. She's a taking minx, and perhaps... Well, perhaps. Hazlitt wasn't his name, don't you see? This new theory started fresh talk, and much excited reasoning, but as it was of the most ignorant sort, it is scarcely worth our while to record it. Meanwhile the twilight gave way to darkness, and Polly Earle failed to reappear. When it was quite dark, the stragglers separated, and then it was seen that the man with the dog had fallen asleep in his chair. Someone strove to wake him. "'Come, come, friend,' said he. "'You'll be getting the rheumatiz if you don't look out. This isn't the right kind of air to sleep in.' The old wayfarer yawned, opened his strange, uneasy eyes, and hobbling to his feet, looked lazily up and down the street. "'What time is it?' he asked. Nine o'clock,' shouted someone. "'Give me a drink, then, and I and my dog will take a walk.' And he drew out a worn wallet, from which he drew a dime, which he handed in through the open window to the now busy landlord. "'Hot!' he croaked. "'I've got chilly sitting out here in the dew.' The glass was handed him, and he drank it off with the ease of an accustomed hand. "'I'll be back before you lock up,' said he, and stepped down into the street, followed by the dog. "'Seems to me I've seen that dog before,' remarked someone. "'Why, don't you know him? That's old Piper, the dead hermit's dog. I wonder how this fellow got hold of him.'" End of chapter 3 Chapter Four of Dr. Izard by Anna Catherine Green. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Dr. Izard. The tramp, who was, as you have seen, not without some small means to make himself respected, paused for a moment in front of the tavern before deciding what direction he would take. Then he went east, or, to make matters clearer to my reader, followed the direction young Polly Earle had taken an hour or so before. Being bent and old, he walked slowly, but as the tavern from which he had emerged was near the end of the street, it was not long before he came upon the big church at the corner, beyond which was the open country and circling high road. They spoke of a graveyard, murmured he, pausing and gazing about him with eyes which seemed to have lost none of their penetration, however bent his figure or aged his face. "'Ah, I think I see it!' And he rambled on in the darkness till he came to a picket fence. But this fence enclosed a dwelling-house, whose large and imposing bulk rose in deepest shadow beyond him, and he had to walk several rods farther before he came to the spot of glimmering headstones and drooping willows. 
A faint moon lent a ghostly light to the place, and as he stopped and bent his head over the intervening wall, weird glimpses were given him of snowy shafts and rounded hillocks, which may have accounted for the length of time he clung there without movement or sound. But finally the dog whining at his heels, or the gleam of a light shining in the distance, recalled him to himself, and he moved, taking the direction of that light, though it led him over the cemetery wall and across such of the graves as lay along the border of the yard adjoining the large house of which I have previously spoken. The dog, who had not left him a moment since he joined him at the cave, shrank as he climbed the wall and the old man took his course alone, treading as softly as he could, but yet making some noise as a broken twig snapped under his foot, or he pressed down some tiny aspiring bush in his rude advance. He was making for the light which shone from the window near the ground in the huge side of the great and otherwise unilluminated house he had passed a few minutes before. He had expected to be met by a fence like the one in front, but to his surprise he soon saw that the graveyard pressed close up to the house, and that there was a monument not ten yards from the very window he was approaching. He had paused at this monument, and was vainly trying to read the inscription which was cut deeply into the side turned toward the moon, when he heard a sudden sound, and, looking toward the house, saw that a door had opened in the blank side of the wall, and that the light had shifted from the window to this open square where it was held high above the head of a remarkable-looking man who was looking directly his way. Convinced that this was Dr. Izard, he held his breath, and slunk as much into the shadow of the shaft as possible. Meanwhile he stared at the picture presented to his notice, and noted every outline of the noble head and small but finely proportioned form that filled the illuminated gap before him. The face he could not see, but the attitude was eloquent, and conveyed so vividly an expression of strained listening and agitated doubt, that this by no means careless observer felt that his step had been heard, and that something more than common curiosity had drawn the doctor to the spot. A sudden sense of his position among the graves, or the chill imparted by his close contact with the stone shaft against which he had flung himself, made the aged wanderer shiver but his emotion, however occasioned, did not last long, for with a sigh that could be plainly heard across the short space, Dr. Izard withdrew his head and closed the door, leaving nothing to be seen in the dim blackness of the house side, but the one square of light which had previously attracted the stranger's attention. With careful step and bated breath, the latter left the tomb by which he had sought refuge, and advanced to this same wall, along which he crept till he reached this uncurtained window. A glimpse of the interior was what he wanted, but as he stopped to listen, he found that he was likely to obtain more than this, for plainly to be heard in the almost death-like quiet came the sound of two voices conversing, and he knew, perhaps by instinct, perhaps by ready reasoning, that they were the voices of the doctor and the pretty new heiress, Polly Earle. To listen might have been a temptation to any man, but to this one it was almost a necessity. His first desire, however, was to see what was before him, and so, with more skill than one would expect, he bent a branch of the vine swaying about him, and, from behind its cover, peered into the shining panes that opened so invitingly beside him. The first thing he saw was the room with its shelves upon shelves of books, piled high to the ceiling. As it answered the triple purpose of doctor's office, student's study, and a misanthrope's cell, it naturally presented an anomalous appearance, which was anything but attractive at first sight. Afterward, certain details stood out, and it became apparent that those curious dangling things which disfigured the upper portion of the room belonged entirely to the medical side of the occupant's calling while the mixture of articles on the walls, some beautiful, but many of them grotesque if not repellent, bespoke the man of taste, whose nature has been warped by solitude. A large door painted green filled up a considerable space of the wall on the left, but judging from the two heavy bars padlocked across it, it no longer served as a means of communication with the other parts of the house. 
On the contrary, it had been fitted from top to bottom with shelves, upon which were ranged a doctor's usual collection of files, boxes, and surgical appliances, with here and there a Chinese image or an Indian god. A rude settle showed where he slept at night, and on the table in the middle of the room a most incongruous litter of books, trinkets, medicines, clothing, sewing materials, and chemical apparatus proclaimed the fact, well known in the village, that no woman ever set foot in the place, save such as came for medical advice, or, on some such errand, has drawn hither the pretty Polly. At the table, and in full view of the peering intruder, sat the genius of the place, Dr. Izard. His back was to the window, and he was looking up at Polly, who stood near, twirling, as usual, her sunbonnet round her dainty forefinger. It was his profile, therefore, which the curious wayfarer saw, but this profile was so fine, and yet so characteristic, that it immediately imprinted itself upon the memory like a silhouette, and the observer felt that he had known it always. Yet it was not till one had been acquainted with the doctor long that all the traits of his extraordinary countenance became apparent. Its intelligence, its sadness, its reserve, and the beauty which gave to all these qualities a strange charm, which was rather awe-inspiring than pleasurable, struck the mind at once, but it was not till after months of intercourse that one saw that the spell he invariably created about him was not due to these obvious qualities, but to something more subtle and enigmatic, something which flashed out in his face at odd times, or fell from his voice under the strain of some unusual emotion, which, while it neither satisfied the eye nor the ear, created such a halo of individuality about the man that dread became terror, or admiration became worship, according to the mental bias of the person observant of him. In age he was nearer fifty than forty, and in colour dark rather than light, but no one ever spoke of him as young or old, light or dark. He was simply Dr. Izard, the pride and the dread of the village, the central point of its intelligent life, on whose eccentricities judgment was suspended, because through him fame had come to the village, and its humble name been carried far and wide. Polly, who feared nobody, but who had for this man, as her rather unwilling benefactor, a wholesome respect, was looking down when the stranger first saw her. The smile which was never long absent from her lips lingered yet in the depths of the dimple that was turned toward the doctor, but the rest of her face showed emotion and a hint of seriousness which was by no means unbecoming to her poetic features. "'You are very good,' she was saying. "'I have often wondered why you were so good to such a little flyaway as I am. But I shall surely remember all you have said, and follow your advice as nearly as possible.' There was an unexpected coldness in the doctor's reply. "'I have advised nothing but what any friend of yours must subscribe to. The woman with whom you are staying is a good woman, but the home she can give you is no longer suitable for a girl who has come, as you say you have, into possession of considerable property. You must find another, and since the house over our heads is a good one, I have ventured to offer it to you for a sum which your man of business certainly will not regard as high, considering its advantages of size and location. By location, do you mean its close proximity to the graveyard? she inquired, with a naive inclination of her coquettish head. I should say, myself, though I never fear anything, that its location is against it. His eye, which had wandered from hers, came back with a stern intentness. Since I have lived here for twenty years, with no other outlook than the graves you see, I cannot be said to be a good judge of the matter. To me the spot has become a necessity, and if you should make the arrangement, I suggest, it must be with the understanding that this room is to be reserved for my use as long as I live, for I could never draw a free breath elsewhere. Nor would any one wish you to, said she. This solitary room, with its dangling skulls and queer old images, its secrecy and darkness, and the graves pressing up almost to your window, seems a part of Dr. Izard. I could not imagine you in a trim office with a gig at the door and a man to drive it. No, it would rob us of half our faith in you, to see you enjoying life like other folks. 
You must stay here if only because my mother, lying over there in her solitary grave, would be lonely were your face to fail to appear every night and morning in your open doorway. Her hand, which had paused in its restless action, pointed over her shoulder to the silent yard without. The physician's eye followed it, and the words of reproof died upon his tongue. "'You think me frivolous,' she cried. "'Well, so I am, at times. But you make me think. But if this sudden accession to fortune fills me with excitement and delight, the sight of you sitting here, and the nearness of my mother's tomb, gives me some sober thoughts, too. And, and, Dr. Izard, will you tell me one thing? Why do people stare when they hear the exact amount of the money left me? It is not because it is so large, for some say it is anything but a large fortune. Is it? She hesitated a little, probably because it was always hard to talk to Dr. Izard. For the reason that it is so near the sum my father was said to have carried away with him when he left me so suddenly? The wind was fluttering the vines, and the doctor turned his head to look that way. When he glanced back, he answered quietly, but with no irritation in his voice. It is hard to tell what causes the stare of ignorant people. What was the amount which has been left you? I do not think you have mentioned the exact figure. Twenty thousand dollars, she whispered. Isn't it splendid? A lordly fortune for such a poor girl as I am? Yes, he acquiesced. Yes. But he seemed struck just as others had been who heard it. And was not that just what was paid Papa by the French government just before Mama died? I have heard it so, was the short reply. And don't you know? she asked. The pout of her lips bespoke the spoiled child, but her little hands were trembling, and he seemed to see only that. Polly, he spoke harshly, for he did not like young girls, or women at all for that matter. I knew many things which I have let slip from my memory. When your father and I were young, we were more or less intimate, being both of us students and ambitious of doing something worth while in this world. But after his disappearance, and the unfortunate surmises to which it gave rise, I made a business of forgetting any confidential communications with which he may have entrusted me, and I advise you not to stir up old griefs by driving me to recall them now. But you were my mother's physician, and saw my father just before he went away. Yes. And did he have twenty thousand dollars in money? They say so. But it seems incredible to me, who only remember my father is looking worried and poor. Twenty thousand dollars was paid him two weeks before your mother died. And he carried all that away with him, and never left a dollar to his little motherless child? Oh, I know that some people say he was foully dealt with, and that it was not of his own free will that he left me to the mercies of the town. But I never believed that. I have always thought of him as alive and many is the night I have waked up crying. Oh, I can cry at night and in the darkness, if I do laugh all day when the sun shines, because I dreamt he was enjoying himself in foreign lands while I... She stopped, looking inquiringly at Dr. Izard, and he, startled, looked inquiringly at her. Then for the second time he rose up, and, taking the light, went out to search up and down the ghostly waste before him, for what he rather felt than knew was near. "'Oh, how late it is getting!' cried the little maiden, peering over his shoulder. "'Did you think you heard someone sigh? I thought I did. But who would come creeping up to this spot? Do you know?' she exclaimed, drawing him in just as he was about to turn his attention to the side of the house against which they stood that I believe it's that horrid green door which gives people the shivers when they come here. Why is it there, and what is on the other side of it, that you bar it up like that? The doctor, lifting his abstracted gaze, stared at the door for a moment, then turned moodily away. It was the old way of going upstairs, he remarked. Why shouldn't I bar it, since I have no further use for the rest of the house? But it's color, she persisted. Why do you not paint it white? When I fit up my den for a bride, then I will, he retorted, and the audacious little thing became dumb on this subject, though she showed no inclination for dropping the other. Dear Dr. Izard, 
she pursued, I know I ought to be going home, but I have something more to ask, and it isn't always that you allow me to speak to you. Our house, you know what I mean, my father's and mother's house, is it really haunted? And is that why it is shut up, even from me? Do you want to go into it, Polly? No, and yet I have sometimes thought I should like to. It must be full of relics of my parents, and if it has not been disturbed since my father went away, why, I might almost see the prints of his feet on the floors, and the pressure of his form in the old lounges and chairs. You are too imaginative, cried the doctor. They will have to marry you to some practical man. She flushed, drew back, and seemed on the point of uttering some violent protest or indignant reproach, but instead of that she returned to the original topic. I should like to hear, from your lips, which never exaggerate or add the least bit of romance to anything you say, just the story of my father's departure and that sudden shutting up of the house. I think I ought to know, now that I am a grown woman and have money of my own. Will you go, after I have told you all that there is to know? he asked, with just a touch of impatience in his naturally severe tone. Yes, she laughed irresistibly moved by his appearance of ill-nature. "'I won't stay one minute longer than you wish me to. Only,' she added, with the sobriety more in accordance with the theme they were discussing, "'do make the whole thing clear to me. I have heard so many stories, and all of them so queer.' He frowned, and his face underwent an indescribable change. You are a silly slip of a girl, and I have a mind to turn you out of the house at once. But, and his eyes wandered away to his books, your curiosity is legitimate, and shall be satisfied. Only not here, he suddenly cried. I will tell you as we walk toward your home. Or in the graveyard outside, she murmured. I am not afraid of the place with you near me. Indeed, I think I should like to hear my mother's story, standing by her tomb. You would! The doctor, astonished, agitated almost by this untoward sentiment, uttered by lips he had only seen parted in laughter, rose, and, leaning on the table, looked over it at her, with eyes whose effect was visible to the straining pair without. Well, you shall have your wish. I will tell you her story, that is, as much as I know of it, standing by her grave without. And with a grim smile, he took up his hat, and stepped quickly before her toward the door. She followed him, with an eager gesture, and in a minute their two shadows could be dimly seen in the moonlight falling over the face of that very shaft behind which the stranger had taken refuge an hour or so before. The vines that swayed about the window ceased their restless rustling, and seemed to cling with heavier shadow than usual to the dismal wall. "'Your father,' said the doctor, was a man of one idea, but that idea was a valuable one, and it paid its projector well. The invention which he conceived, perfected, and made practical, was an important one, suited to large governmental undertakings, and meeting the wants of France especially. It was bought, as I have said, from your father for the sum of twenty thousand dollars. But this good fortune, while deserved, had not come early and your mother, who had been overburdened in her youth, was on her deathbed when the favourable news came. It comforted her, but it almost maddened your father, if I may judge from the frenzied expressions he used in my hearing. He did not touch the money, and when she died he locked himself up in a room, from which he only emerged to attend her funeral. This I tell you, that you may see that his paternal instinct was not as great as his conjugal one or he would not have forgotten you in his grief. Did you speak? No, no, but it is gloomy here, after all. Let us go on into the highway. But the man clinging to the wall was not forced to move. The doctor did not heed her entreaty, or if he did he ignored it, for his voice went coldly and impassively on. The night after your mother was buried, your father was seen looking from one of the windows of his house. The next morning he was missing. That is all I can tell you, Polly. No one knows any more than that. But wasn't there somebody in the house besides himself? Where was I? Oh, you were there, and an old woman who had been looking after you in your mother's illness. 
but you were too young to realize anything, and the woman, she has since died, had nothing to say, but that she was sure she heard your father go out. And the money? Went with him. Oh, I have heard it all before, came after a moment's silence, in sharp and plaintive tones. But I was in hopes you could tell me something different, something new. Did they look for my father as I would have done, had I been old enough to understand? I headed the search myself, Polly, and later the police from Boston came down, and went through the town thoroughly. But they met with no results. And now a stranger leaves me twenty thousand dollars. Dr. Izard, I should like to know something about that stranger. He died in the Chicago hospital, I am told. I will make inquiries. If, if he had anything to do with my father's disappearance. You will never know it. The man is dead. A silence followed these few words, during which the agitated breathing of the young girl could be heard. Then her quivering voice rose in the impatient cry, Yes, yes, but it would be such a relief to know the truth. As it is, I am always thinking that each stranger I see coming into town is he. Not that it makes me timid or melancholy, nothing could do that, I think, but still I'm not quite happy, nor can this money make me so, while any doubts remain as to my father's fate. I cannot help you, the doctor declared. For fourteen years you have borne your burden, little one, and time should have taught you patience. If I were in a position like yours, I would not allow old griefs to fret me. I should consider that a man who had been missing most of my lifetime was either dead or so indifferent that I ran but little chance of seeing him again. I myself do not think there is the least likelihood of your ever doing so. Why then not be happy? Well, I will, she sighed. I'm sure it's not my nature to be otherwise. But something either in these dismal trees, or in yourself, or in myself, makes me almost gloomy to-night. I feel as if a cloud hung over me. Am I very foolish, doctor? And will you be taking me back to the office to give me a dose of some bitter black stuff to drive away the horrors? I had rather you would give me a fatherly word. I am so alone in the world for all my friends. He may have answered this appeal by some touch or sympathetic move, but if he did, the listener was not near enough to catch it. There was a rustling where they stood, and in another instant the bare head of the young girl was visible again in the moonlight. "'I think I'll be going home,' said she, and turning towards the gateway. The doctor followed her, and together they left the cemetery and entered the high road. When the sound of their voices had died away in the distance, a deep and heavy shadow separated itself from the side of the house near the window, and resolving itself again into the image of the man through whose ears we have listened to the broken dialogue we have endeavoured to transcribe, took up its stand before the still-lighted window, and for several minutes studied the peculiar interior most diligently. Then it drew off, and sliding down the path which followed the side of the house, emerged upon the road and took its own course to the village. Something which he did not see, and something which he did not hear, took place at the other end of the town before a cheerfully lighted mansion. Dr. Izard and Polly had traversed the length of the street, and had nearly reached the cottage in which she was at present living, when the former felt a little hand now thrust confidingly into his arm, flutter and shift a trifle. As the girl had regained her spirits, and was now chatting in quite a merry way upon indifferent topics, he looked up to see what it was that had affected her and saw nothing save the lights of the Unwin place, and a figure which must have been that of young Unwin sitting on the shadowy veranda. As he had reasons of his own for not liking to pass this house, he stopped and glanced at the young girl inquiringly. She had ceased speaking, and her head was hanging so low that the curls dropped against her cheek, hiding her eyes and the expression of her mouth. "'I think,' she whispered, "'if you don't mind, that I will walk on the other side of you, it is very late for me to be out, even with you, and Clark... The doctor, drawing in his breath, turned his full face on her, and stood so long gazing into her drooping countenance, that she felt frightened, and attempted to move on. Instantly he responded to her wish, and they passed the house with quick and agitated steps, 
but when the shadows of the next block had absorbed them, they both paused as it were simultaneously, and the doctor said with something more than his usual feeling in his thin, fine voice, "'Do you care for Clark Unwin, little one?' Her answer struck him. "'Do I care for breath, for life? He has been both to me ever since I could remember anything, and now he cares for me.' The doctor, lost in some overwhelming dream or thought, did not answer her for several minutes. Then he suddenly lifted her face by its dainty chin, and in a deep, controlled tone, totally different from the one he had used a short time before, he solemnly remarked, "'For fourteen years I have taken an interest in you, and done for you what I have done for nobody else in the town. I hope that my care has made a good girl of you.' and that under all your fanciful ways and merry antics there hides a true woman's heart. "'I don't know,' she whispered. "'I know that I would rather give up my fortune than one little memory connected with these last three weeks.' "'And he—he he loves you? You are sure of it, little one?' The lift of her head was eloquent. The doctor wished he could see her face, but the darkness was too thick for that. "'May heaven bless you!' faltered on his tongue, but the words were too unusual to the ascetic's cold lips for them to pass into speech, and the girl thought his manner more distant and unsympathetic than common. "'It is a secret I have told you,' she murmured, and being then within a few steps of her own gate, she slid from his grasp and vanished in the darkness. He, with a sigh that seemed to render the icy bonds which years of repression had bound about his breast, remained for a moment with his head bent, gazing on the ground at his feet. Then he drew himself up, and passed quickly back over the road he had come. End of chapter 4 Chapter 5 of Dr. Izard by Anna Catherine Green This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Nocturnal Wanderings The wanderer, of whose name even the landlord of the tavern seemed uncertain, passed some curious days after this. Upon the plea of wanting work, he visited house after house in the village, staying in each one as long as he was made welcome. Though no talker, he seemed to like to have talk going on around him, and if he sometimes went to sleep over it, he was forgiven by the simple and credulous inhabitants on account of his old age and seeming decrepitude. In one house he was given breakfast, in another dinner, but in none did he find work, though he assured everybody that he was very good in the field, notwithstanding the unfortunate curvature of his back. It was not an uncommon thing in Hamilton for men to pass from house to house in this way, and he was little noticed, but if any one had been curious enough to watch his eye, they would have observed that it had a remarkably penetrating power, and that but little escaped its notice. Another thing that would also have been noticed was the curious look of recognition which would suddenly creep into his eyes, as if he saw some of these things for the second time and if any one had walked near enough to him to listen as well as watch, he would have heard a name drop from his lips now and then, as he walked up the flock's bordered walk of some humble garden, or stopped at the back door of one of the more pretentious mansions on the main street. Another thing, when he had done this, when he had uttered, in his odd, musing way, at the threshold of a house, the name of Fisher, Hutton, Brown, Unwin, or what not, he invariably managed in some way, either slyly or by bold question, to ascertain if this name really belonged to the family then residing there. If it did, he nodded his head complacently. If it did not, he frowned as if disappointed in his memory or whatever it was that had played him false. At one place he showed conclusively that he had been in the house before, though no one seemed keen enough to detect the fact. He was passing down a hall when he turned to the right and came plumb up against a wall. This was where there had formerly been a door of egress, but a change which had been made some ten years back in the inner arrangement of the house had placed it farther on, and his face showed surprise when he noticed it, though the expression was speedily suppressed. Again at the Fishers 
he was very careful to sit in the deep shadow, and though he eagerly drank in all that was said, he himself made no remark after his first appeal for work. The Fishers were old neighbours of the Earls, and it was with them that Polly was living. In the afternoon he found himself in the eastern end of the town, near the church. As he noticed the venerable building, he seemed to call to mind his experiences of the night before, for he glanced eagerly toward the cemetery, and finally turned his steps in that direction, saying quietly to himself, Let's see how it looks by daylight. The street, which takes a sharp turn at this point, was headed by the stately house whose dim columns and embowering trees had so struck the wanderer's attention the night before. Seen by daylight, it was less mysterious in appearance, but fully as imposing, though there were signs of neglect on its painted front and solitary balconies, which spoke of long disuse as a dwelling. It had the name of Izard engraved on the tarnished door-plate. "'Let me see,' mused the tramp, leaning upon one of the old-fashioned gate-posts guarding the entrance. "'I should remember how the house looks inside.' I was here to a ball once when we were all young folks together. It was a fine old dwelling then, and Mrs. Izard, who always said she could remember Martha Washington, looked like a queen in it. Lifting his head, he glanced up at the pillared front. There was a large double drawing-room on this side, he murmured, with a big-figured carpet on the floor and panelled paper on the walls. I think I could remember the very tints if I tried for I sat that night for full ten minutes staring at it, while Lily Unwin chattered nonsense in my ear, and... The rest was lost in his long, dishevelled beard, which was much too grey to be worn by any contemporary of Dr. Izard. On the left, he presently proceeded, was the library, with one or two windows looking out upon the cemetery, which was then a respectable distance off, and down the hall, which was wide enough to dance a Virginia reel in, there hung a map of the Holy Land, with one corner torn off. I wonder if it is hanging there still, and if I can remember which corner was lacking. He mused a minute with a sour smile. Something must be pardoned in one who has been gone fourteen years, he murmured. I cannot remember whether it was the left or the right-hand corner. Shutting his eyes, he leaned his head again on the post, while short, broken sentences issued by fits and starts from amid his beard as he brooded over the past. Under the big front staircase, I remember it well. There was a smaller circular one, which went down to a certain green door. The same one I noticed in the doctor's office, though there was no office then, only a rectangular porch. He must have had the office built in since I left the town, for he used to see his patients in the library. Now, how did that porch look? It was broad and low, and raised but a step or two above the ground. There were two pillars in the opening toward the graveyard, similar to the big columns in front, but smaller and set further apart. At one end was a wooden seat built in the woodwork, and at the other a green door, the same as that seen in the doctor's room now. Will these details answer for one recollection? I think they will. And now for a glimpse of that shaft. Lifting his head from the gate-post, he picked his way through the tangled weeds to the little gate on the highway which led directly to the doctor's office. Entering, he approached the tombstone against which he had leaned the night before, and heedless of passers-by, took up his stand before it, and began reading the inscription. Sacred to the memory of Hulda Earl, born December 3, 1854, died August 9, 1878. I wonder who put up this monument, he muttered, and shuddered slightly, as he recalled the chilliness of the stone against which he had pressed his breast the night before. But the emotion was but transitory, and he was soon surveying the small square window through whose panes the one light had shone on the previous night. It was near the office door, and was surrounded, as he had so gratefully experienced at that time, by a thick-leaved trumpet vine whose long and swaying branches recalled to him the anxious moment when the doctor had stepped to the door, drawn by some sound he had made in his curiosity and interest. Just now a curtain hung before the window, sure sign that the doctor was within. But he did not heed this, possibly because he did not understand the signal, 
and remained where he was, musing on the past, till the steps of some advancing visitor advised him that he might better indulge his thoughtful mood in a less conspicuous place, and in a solitude not so likely to be invaded by curious eyes. The dog, which had joined him at his first appearance in town, continued to be his constant companion. All day this faithful animal followed him, and when night came they went together into the small attic chamber which was the only room in the house he could afford to pay for. But one journey which the man took was not shared by the dog. It took place at midnight, and in the following mysterious way. He had noticed, by a minute inspection of the roof, stretching below his one small window, that by a few daring steps down the first incline one might reach a ledge from which descent to the ground would be easy. It was a path which might be taken with safety by a young man or a still vigorous middle-aged man. But would it be a feasible one for him? He seemed to decide in the affirmative, for in the small wee hours of the night he rose from his bed, and quieting his ready dog, dressed himself, and took another long survey from the window. Then he proceeded to open the bundle he had brought into town, taking from it a small object which he hid in the breast of his coat. Then he thrust a box of matches into the pocket of his shirt, and ignoring his hat, which hung on a nail in one corner, he began his daring descent. Throwing one leg out of the window, and clinging to the narrow jam, he whirled himself about, and developing some of the instincts of the cat, soon reached the ledge in safety. Instantly his form, which had hitherto been so bent as to present almost the appearance of deformity, straightened itself until his whole person betrayed an agility and precision surprising to behold in any man past the first flush of youth. To pass from the eaves to the shed and thence to the ground was the work of a moment. The crooked branch of an old apple tree, which grew near the house, was of decided use to him, and enabled him to make his risky descent with comparatively no noise. When he was on the ground he stopped and listened, then wheeling rapidly about, proceeded to walk up the street. The night was dark and threatened storm. Everywhere there was a sound of swishing boughs and rattling panes which served to deaden the noise of his tread on the pavement but he seemed so anxious not to attract attention even in the darkness and solitude of this midnight hour, that he stepped into the grass that bordered the road, and even took off his shoes that no echo might follow his movements. The course he took led him in an entirely different direction from any he had traversed during the day. As soon as he reached the point where the courthouse stands, he turned east and went up Carberry Hill. As there are but two or three houses on this slope, his destination became speedily apparent. On the brow of the hill, where the wind blows strongest, stands the old Earl Cottage, with its windows closed to every eye and its untrod doorstep hidden amid the weeds that had choked up the entrance for many a year. In the daylight it had an utterly lonesome and deserted look, but at night, especially when the moon was hidden and the winds blew, it possessed a forbidding, almost an ominous look, which would have deterred any one whose errand was less pressing than that of our midnight wanderer from approaching, much less examining a spot so given over to solitude. A row of stunted oak trees shielded the house on one side, and marked off the limits of the deserted garden, where burdock and thistles grew instead of the homely vegetables and old-fashioned flowers of years ago. Tonight all these trees were bending one way in the sharp gale, their whistling leaves and the pat-pat of the long limbs against the clapboards of the house adding to the lugubriousness of the scene. But to the man who stood in the long grass at the rear of this disused dwelling there was nothing in the hour or place to arouse dread or awaken apprehension. He studied the house, but not with the eyes of a dreamer, and when he finally made up his mind to approach the rear door, it was with determination in his face and a certain calculation in his movement which proved that he was there with a definite purpose. One pull at the door evidently satisfied him of the uselessness of endeavouring to enter by force, for he left the spot at once and began climbing a small shed nearby. Reversing the plan he had followed at the tavern, he succeeded in climbing from ledge to ledge until he reached a certain window which he ruthlessly smashed in. 
In less time than one would think, he had effected entrance into the house at the very place where there was least likely of the attempt being discovered, namely, under the shadow of one of those swishing trees whose branches brushed so close against the wall that a spray of leaves immediately thrust itself into the opening after him, covering up his passage with unnecessary haste, considering that there were no watchers within half a mile or more. The place in which he found himself on dropping to the floor was so close and dark that he involuntarily opened out his arms to grope his way. But fearing broken floors and open staircases, he presently stopped and drew out the small object he had hidden in his breast, and which proved to be a pocket lantern. Lighting this, he looked around him and drew a deep breath of satisfaction. He was in a small attic room whose unfinished beams were so overlaid with cobwebs that he involuntarily ducked his head, though he was in but little danger of thrusting it against these noisome objects. A bed covered with a patched quilt was within reach of one hand, and on the other side was a chest of drawers with the articles necessary for making a humble toilet still on it, but so covered by the dust and cobwebs of years that he choked as he looked at it, and hesitated to set down his lantern on it. Finally he compromised matters by placing it on an old chair, after which he took out a small blank book and began to jot down notes of what he saw. When finished with this room, he passed into another, and so on into the more roomy living chambers in front. Here he paused and took a deeper breath, though the air was still stifling and musty. An opening, square in shape, occupied the middle of this upper floor, from which branched off the three sleeping rooms of this simple but not uncomfortable cottage. In the square were books, many of which this strange intruder took from the shelves and rapidly glanced over. Then he opened the small drawers at the bottom of the shelves, examining the trinkets and knick-knacks thus disclosed, with an eye rapidly brightening into an expression of mingled hope and determination. The pictures on the wall were few, but he apparently saw them all, nor did he pass the decayed fringes of the window curtains without touching them and noting their faded colors. When all that was to be seen in this small place was carefully remarked, the man crossed the threshold of the right-hand door and entered the large west chamber. Something, was it the atmosphere of the place, or some train of recollections awakened by the objects about him? seemed to subdue him at this point, and he paused for a moment with his head fallen on his breast. Then he raised it again, and with even more resolution than before, began to survey the mildewed walls and faded furniture, with an eye that missed nothing, from the great four-poster to the mould-covered bellows at the side of the open fireplace. It had been Mrs. Earle's bedroom, and had witnessed the birth of Polly and the long and mysterious illness which had terminated in the death of the mother. Here Ephraim Earle had lavished kisses on his babe, and laid his icy hand over the scarcely colder lids of his dead wife. Here had he experienced his keenest joys, and here had he suffered his greatest sorrows. The room seemed alive with them yet, and from every corner stared mementos of the past which were all the more eloquent and impressive that no foreign hand had touched them since their owner had passed away from their midst a dozen years before. Even the candle which had lighted her last gasp remained where it had been left on a little table in one corner, and beside it was a book from which the finger seemed to have been just withdrawn, though the dust that covered it lay thick on its browned cover, and the mark which issued from one end of its discoloured leaves had lost its pristine hue, and had faded to a tint almost beyond recognition. The stranger stopped before this book, and seemed to be tempted to take it up but refrained from doing so, as he had already refrained from meddling with many another object lying on the high cupboards and the tall mantel-shelf. But before the sticks in the fireplace he showed no such hesitation. He turned them and twirled them, and examined the ashes in which they had lain, and finally, seeing the end of a piece of paper, he drew it out. It was the fragment of a letter, worthless probably, and of no especial interest in itself but he seemed to regard it as a treasure, and after looking at it for a minute, he thrust it into his pocket. There were a few articles of apparel hanging in the press at the foot of the bed, and these he looked carefully over. 
Some of them were men's clothes, and these he handled with a lingering touch, smiling grimly as he did so. He even took down a coat, and after a moment's thought put it on, and surveyed himself thus accoutred in the film-covered mirror at the other end of the room. But the latter was too clouded to make a good reflection, and pleased to see that the sleeves came naturally to the wrist, though the buttons failed to fasten over the chest, he muttered stealthily as he drew the garment off, "'One's arms do not lengthen with age, though the body often grows larger. A very good test, indeed.' There was a chest under the bed, and this he drew out, though with some evident misgivings, and many a sly look at the worm-eaten carpet over which he had been obliged to drag it. The lock had been fastened, but he opened it with the crooked nail he drew from his pocket, and plunging into the trunk, pulled out one article after another, muttering in an indescribable tone as he handled each. "'My wife's wedding dress! The locket and chain I gave her!' the cashmere shawl she always called her best, the lace falderalls Aunt Millicent used to wear, and Grandpa Hallam's gown in which he died when he was struck with apoplexy while preaching in Brother Burton's pulpit in Charlestown. A collection of keepsakes all remembered by me, even to this old spectacle case which must have been her grandmother's. Putting the things all back in the exact order in which he found them, he relocked the trunk and thrust it carefully back into its old place. But before leaving the room, he stood for several minutes in the doorway, and let, or seemed to let, the full aspect of the place sink into his consciousness, after which, with a half-frightened look at the floor, as if he feared he had left the print of his feet behind him, he stepped again to the hall, and so into the small room adjoining. Here he remained longer than in the one he had just left for it had been Mr. Earle's workroom, and it was full of reminiscences of his old labours. To enumerate the various objects which this strange intruder examined would occupy us too long, and needlessly encumber this narrative. Enough that he gave the place the same minute inspection he had accorded to every other spot he had previously entered, and by force of vivid imagination or a faithful remembrance seemed to live for a short half-hour in a past of hopeful work and mechanical triumphs. There was an inventor's model in one corner, and to this he gave his closest attention. Though he laid no finger upon it, fearful perhaps of leaving some trace of his presence behind him, he studied its parts with a glistening eye and half-sarcastic smile, saying, as he turned away at last, "'This is where the art of making explosives stood in sixty-three. We have got further than that now.' There was a secretary in this room, and before it he spent most of the remaining time. Some old letters which he found there engrossed him completely, and from one small drawer he took an object that interested him so much he failed to replace it on leaving the room. It was the faded miniature of a pale young mother and a blue-eyed babe. The mother had the look of the Lawrence family, and the child the promise of that saucy and irresponsible loveliness he had seen the day before in the new-maid heiress, Polly Earle. This was not all he carried away. After he had finished the letters, he sat a long time, musing with knitted brows and rigid hands. Then he examined the desk, and, sounding it, listened with accustomed ear to the echo made by his knuckles on the various partitions. Suddenly he stopped, and leaning over a certain receptacle, from which he had drawn a small drawer, he tapped again and seeming to be satisfied with the result, he began to manipulate the place with his penknife till the false bottom came out, and he found in the shallow space thus disclosed a small box which he eagerly pulled out, opened, and examined. What it held I do not know, but whatever it was, he thrust it with a triumphant look into his breast, and then, repairing the mischief he had done, first closed the drawers and then the desk, shaking visibly as he did so, perhaps with something of the feeling of a thief, though his face had none of the aspects of one, and his step when he moved away had a resolution in it that added height to his stature, which since he had allowed himself to walk upright was imposing. In another moment he had carried the lantern from the room, and the sleep of years had descended again upon its dark and silent precincts. End of chapter 5 
Chapter six of Dr. Izard by Anna Catherine Green. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Portrait Had the sides of this house suddenly fallen in and revealed to the distant neighbors at the foot of the hill the vision of this creeping marauder passing through the haunted rooms and down the creaking staircases of this long unopened house, what a panic of fear would have swept through them at the uncanny sight! Glints of light from the small lantern which he carried passed flickering from wall to wall, and on one window-shade, through an exaggerated outline of his form, with its long beard and groping hand, which, if seen from without, would have sent most persons hurrying down the road. But there was no one in the fields that night, and this passing glimpse of the intruder went out in darkness, without any other alarm being given than that which came from the creaking pines and pollards without. He was on the first floor now, and being more fearful of surprise than in the rooms above, he trod more carefully and was more attentive as to where the light of his lantern fell. The parlour, which in houses of this stamp is sufficiently musty when the place is inhabited and a dozen children pass its charmed door every day, was worse than a tomb on this night of its resurrection, and almost drove the man, who so fearlessly opened it, into the open air for refreshment being near the ground, its walls had become a prey to damp and mildew, and had not the two family portraits adorning the space over the mantel-shelf been so fortunate as to hang on an inner wall, their ruin would not have been confined to the gilded frames. It was before these pictures the visitor took his stand. One was the portrait of an old man, and at this he barely glanced but on the other he gazed earnestly and long, calling up the living appearance of the man it represented and comparing it with his own. "'Taken a year after marriage,' he presently commented, with his old sarcastic smile, "'that was, let me see, seventeen years ago. No wonder the cheeks are fresh-coloured and the locks unmixed with grey. When I am shaved and my beard trimmed, the difference of years will not be so perceptible.' yet time makes changes under the most favourable circumstances, and when a man has led a life like mine, his features naturally coarsen. I must remember this fact when people tell me I have lost the frank, attractive look I see here. Fast living and wild expenditure leave their marks, and I will be as good an example of the returned prodigal as any Bible-pounding exhorter could wish. Yet, and he sighed, it is not altogether pleasant to remember one's misdeeds, or to note the difference in such a face as this and that which lies under my long disfiguring beard. These words, which he had uttered aloud, had no sooner left his lips than he was startled by the silence that followed. A sense of his position suddenly came over him, and casting one final glance at the portrait, he turned quickly away, murmuring under his breath, that ring on the finger, it was pawned long ago. What a past I will have to disclose if my friends inquire into the matter too closely. Fifteen minutes more he spent in cellar and attic, and then he swung himself out of the window on to the tree, and then slightly to the ground. As he did so, he thought he heard a sigh, but just at that moment the trees gave a great swish and bent almost double and he forgot the lesser sound, and never thought to look behind him when he started to move down the road. Had he done so, he would have seen by the first faint streaks of morning light a figure standing at the angle of the house, with hat pulled low, and hands thrust out in superstitious protest at what was evidently considered a spectre stalking from the haunted house. The next day the bent and feeble wayfarer announced that there was no work to be found in Hamilton, and took his leave of the place, followed by the faithful dog. But at the outskirts of the town the latter paused, and, whining, raised his protest at this departure, and when he found that his new master was determined to go, he lay down in the dusty road and refused to accompany him any further. He would not leave the town in which his old master lay buried. End of chapter 6